Good morning. It is great to have you with us today. And we're in Matthew chapter 17. We're actually going to look at Mark 9. And so why? Because Mark 9 gives the same story as we come across in Matthew 17. But Mark gives a whole lot more detail. Um, You know, uh, people are different. And each of the gospel writers is different. And the Holy Spirit breathed through them, but their personality still comes out. And one of the things we see often in Mark's gospel that we don't see in Matthew's gospel is Mark deals a lot more with the people involved. So the story we look at today, Matthew gives you all the details and the facts and the bottom line to the story. Mark tells us about the Father and what's going on in his life. And and I don't know if you've noticed that, but people are different. Our staff, uh, at Christmas, we were at uh, Cracker Barrel, went to staff, kind of a staff brunch. Some of our staff were there, and we were buying, uh, we we had some of the money left over from our gift cards to buy people's meals. And so we were just buying everyone's meal that came into Cracker Barrel. And I bought a lady's and went back and sat down at the table and she came over and she's like, I just want to give you a hug. I'm not a hugger, especially some stranger. So you know what I did? I said, Andy will be glad to give you a hug. So Andy was the designated hugger. People have different personalities, right? And, and we see that in the Gospels. <clears throat> and so today we're, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew, but I want us just to sneak over to Mark. Because there's some things Mark tells us here that Matthew leaves out. Before we look at this passage, let's kind of fill in the gap. Last week, we saw Jesus took Peter, James, and John apart from the other disciples. And they went to the top of the mountain. And there they saw Jesus transfigured. They saw him transformed. They saw the glory that was his fully revealed. For the past 30-some years, Jesus' divinity had been veiled by his humanity. And they saw his unfiltered glory on the mountain. And he's there talking with Elijah and Moses. And Peter says, you know, it's good for us to be here. Let's hang out here. We should just stay here. In fact, let's get some tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Let's just stay up here for a while. And Jesus is like, no, we're going back down the mountain. And so they went from this scene of seeing the glory of God completely unveiled. And they leave that scene and they come on the scene we pick up with today. Father, we come before you today and we just pray that you would meet with us here this morning. I pray, Lord, you would open our hearts and minds to you. Be with me as I speak. Give me wisdom and clarity and power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, when they came to the disciples, now these are the disciples that were left. Three went on the mountain, there were 12, that means nine are left. And they come down the mountain, they came to the disciples, and they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing or debating with them about? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he is a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Now, can you imagine what's going through Peter, James, and John's mind right now, right? They have been up on the mountain. They've seen the unfiltered glory of God. And they come down the mountain, and there's this scene of chaos and confusion. There's this father. Can you imagine that father? 
what's going on in the life of his son. He can't help. No one can help. And this father in desperation has brought his son to Jesus, hoping maybe that his son can be healed. And Jesus isn't there, but his disciples are. And they've cast out demons, and they've healed. And he brings them to him and says, Please, you've got to do something for my son. And they've tried, and they've failed. And now there's this argument amongst the scribes and the disciples about why they failed. And the father's son is still in agony, suffering under satanic power. And the crowd's joining in this debate. And there's all this chaos, and there's all this suffering, and there's all this pain, and there's all this hurt. And you know what I bet Peter, James, and John are thinking? Can we go back up the mountain? I liked it up there a lot better. See, Peter, James, and John may have wanted to stay up on the mountain, but Jesus didn't. Jesus knew what he was coming down into. And he came down anyway. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Matthew actually says, O faithless and perverse generation. He, he's alluding back to Deuteronomy. We'll talk about that in a moment. So he says, look, bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You know, notice it was while... This boy was still a young child that Satan got a foothold in his life. Many people try to tell us that, that it's not right to try to force your faith on your children. That, that you need to just kind of let them grow up neutral and then, then let them decide for themselves. May I tell you something? Satan and the world will not allow your children to live in neutrality. Satan and the world are not going to allow to wait until your children and grandchildren grow up to decide what they're going to do. It is while this boy is still very young that Satan gets a foothold in his life. And if you're here today and you're in the younger side of life, do not buy into the idea that you can live a neutral life today. You are choosing to serve someone today. The Bible says even a child is known by his doings. Samuel was a young boy when he began to serve the Lord. David is still a teenager when God says that he looked throughout the whole world and he wanted a man after his own heart and he chose a teenager like David. Don't buy into the idea that it is not proper or it is not reasonable to expect you while you are still young to give your life to God. While you are young, you will give your life to someone and something. And while this young boy was still young, Satan got a foothold on his life. And notice its goal. It often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Satan's goal is to destroy. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. <coughs> but notice what the Father says. But if you can do anything, now if, he says that Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Jesus' response is interesting. <clears throat> if you can. He said, Jesus, if you can do anything, 
And Jesus says, wait, no, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Jesus says, wait a minute, this isn't really just about me. It's about you. Do you have the faith? Do you believe? All things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. <clears throat> and when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he rose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Now we're going to flip over to Matthew for one verse. Matthew adds something that Mark doesn't. Jesus said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Now, notice what happens here. There's several things Jesus teaches that are very important. He said, Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed. Do you know mustard seed was was the smallest seed that they had in that culture? So Jesus is kind of, he says, your little faith, he said, you don't even have to have much faith. If your faith was even as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, there's several things that we need to unpack in this verse that are often misunderstood. And we talked a little bit about it last week, but people misunderstand what this is saying about prayer and about the power God gives us. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say you will say to any mountain. He says this mountain. So the question is, what mountain is he referring to? I don't believe he's referring to a physical mountain. He's, the, the context is, this boy had a demon. And the disciples could not cast out that demon. They could not make that demon move. That demon was the mountain that was in front of them. And Jesus said, look, if you had faith, you could say to this mountain, move. What did Jesus do? Jesus came to that demon and said, you move, and it moved. The disciples could not make it move. And he said, then nothing will be impossible for you. So, <clears throat> the mountain in the context is that demon. See, they had already been given authority to cast out demons. In times past, they had cast out demons, yet this time they failed. And then going back to Mark, Mark said, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. By prayer. Now, one more thing and then we'll pull this thought together. What Jesus is not talking about is praying to God to cast out the demon. Right? Because Jesus did not pray to the Father to get the demon to move. Jesus commanded the demon and the demon left. Throughout the Gospels, we never see Jesus pray to God to remove a demon. He cast them out. So what is Jesus saying here? Here's the whole point. The disciples had fallen into a trap. They had been successful in ministry. And they started thinking that they had the power to do ministry apart from God. They're doing ministry. They're doing for God had replaced their being with God. They had been successful in casting out demons. And they started thinking they had power to cast out demons rather than they had authority to cast out demons. 
See, the miracles they had done were not miracles that they had done, but miracles that God had done through them. Right? They did not cast out demons. God cast out demons through them. They did not have the power to heal the sick. God had the power to heal the sick through them. But you know what happened? Over time, they're doing ministry, doing ministry, and they're like, we're good at this. Right? I mean, I cast out eight demons today. I'm, I'm getting good. And after a while, they became busy doing ministry. And you know what Jesus kept doing? Jesus keeps withdrawing from ministry to spend time with God. And apparently the disciples didn't. And they started thinking that they could do it on their own. They started thinking that they were successful enough and they were powerful enough. Or I'll put it this way. Like the disciples, those who at one time have done great exploits for the cause of Christ have at other times failed entirely and proved unstable as water. The best of Christians has nothing of which to glory. They have only what they have received. Should he or she endeavor to serve and live for a season without Christ, they will see their power is gone. Jesus said in John 15, 5 to the disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So you think of that imagery for a second. You, you, you have the apple tree, and you have a branch from that apple tree. And you know what? If that apple tree branch is connected to the vine, is connected to the root of the tree, do you know what that branch is capable of doing? Producing apples. But what about if the branch says, you know, I've, I, four or five years now, I've produced some really good apples. I don't need the root, I don't need the trunk of the tree anymore. I can do this on my own. So the branch gets cut off from the rest of the tree. Do you know what you find out real quick? That branch does not produce apples. And here's what very often happens to us. The same thing that happened to the apostles. We confuse what God does through us with what we're capable of doing. And we see in this passage this dynamic. Jesus says, look. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But he just told the disciples, he said, nothing will be impossible for you. So here's the dilemma. On my own, nothing of significance can be accomplished. God, through me, anything God wants can be accomplished. God, through me, unlimited power. Me alone, unlimited possibilities for failure. And see, when we confuse what God does through us with what we can do, we have problems. It's like a boxing glove. A boxing glove has no power. A boxing glove just sits there. But you let the right person put on that boxing glove, and all of a sudden that boxing glove has some power. Remember watching Mike Tyson when I was growing up? You let Mike Tyson put on that boxing glove, and all of a sudden that boxing glove that sat there immobile now can do amazing things. And see, what the disciples started thinking is that they had power when really they only had authority. They started to believe the press clippings. They started to think they were healing and casting out demons and doing wonderful things rather than God was doing them through him. He calls them a faithless and perverse generation. He's pulling from Deuteronomy 32. He's wanting to connect them. And, and it's really interesting. I know Dan was going to sing that last song, We Will Remember. But that song really says everything Israel didn't do. I want to look at a couple of verses in Deuteronomy 32. Verse 5, they have dealt corruptly with God. They are no longer as children because they are blemished. They are crooked and twisted generation. Verse 18, 
Why? You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. What made them perverse and faithless? They forgot God. They forgot that he was the one that created them, that he was the one that called them to be a nation. <clears throat> Verse 20, he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they were a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. Lest they should say, our hand is triumphant. It was not the Lord who did all this. What led to this? They forgot God, and they started taking credit for what God had done. And then finally it says, if they were wise, they would have understood this. They would discern their latter end. How could one have chased a thousand, and two have put ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them, and the Lord had given them up? For their rock is not as our rock. Our enemies are by themselves. Jesus, when the children of Israel came in the promised land, one of them drove and fought away a thousand. He said, if they would have thought about it, they would have known it wasn't because they were strong enough to do that. It was because God worked through them. And here's the reality. On my own, I'm one step away from failure. God working through me, I'm capable of the impossible. And the moment you or I start thinking that we are competent or qualified or capable to accomplish anything of significant apart from him, we're a step away from failure. Well, let's simply look at our principle. Notice finally that the father prayers delivered his son. The son was delivered because the father never stopped crying out to God for mercy. Don't give up on your children and your grandchildren. Don't stop praying for your family and your friends. Keep praying. Keep seeking God. Keep bringing Him. Well, that's the story, and I just want to bring two points of application that stood out to me this week. The first... <clears throat> um, Nick, mute that for a moment. Or give me a blank slide, please. The first thing I want to see is what should we expect to find? What should we expect to find when we come to a group of people? What should we expect to find even when we come to church? See, a lot of times we get frustrated by unmet expectations. And oftentimes those are unrealistic expectations. And you know what a lot of times people expect to find when they come to church? They expect the mountaintop experience, right? They want what the disciples encountered on the mountain. This, this glimpse of God's glory, there's no strife, there's no division, there's just this unfiltered glimpse of God's glory. And you know what? Those are awesome when they happen, but they don't happen often. Best I can tell, that happened once in Jesus' ministry, and only three of the disciples got to see it. And you know why a lot of people get frustrated with church? Because we have unbiblical expectations of church. We expect the mountaintop and we find the valley. We want to come to church and have this emotional glorified view of God and what we end up with is all these struggling, disappointing people. I, I know you've never thought that. You've never experienced that. See, more often what we find is what Christ and the disciples found coming down the mountain. They found sorrow and suffering and sin. Jesus, however, was not frustrated with the father of the boy. He wasn't frustrated with the boy. He wasn't even frustrated with the crowd. He was frustrated that his followers had not responded correctly to the problem. See, why should we be... We live in a world that has been broken by sin. We live in a world of sorrow and pain and hurt. And why should we be surprised when we come to church and find hurting people? 
Why should we be surprised when we come to church and find people that are dealing with the difficult struggle with Satan and sin all week? Why should we be surprised when we come to church and find people that are sorrowful for the losses of the world? That's what we should expect to find. That's the real world. And a lot of us want to come to church and find another world. I I forgot who said it. They said, you know, this world has problems, but it's still the only place you can find a good steak. The real world is a plane of hurt and pain and brokenness. And God did not tell us to expect people to come to church and be exempt from that. Do you know what he told us to do? To expect people to come to church and be ministered to in the midst of that. It's okay to come to church hurting. It's okay to come to church after you blew it once again with the sin that you promised you were going to give up. I'd rather you come anyway. I'd rather the person that messed up and got drunk last night and blew it come to church on Sunday morning anyway. The person that's struggling with prayers that have not been answered and they're angry and they're bitter with God, come to church anyway. The person that has questions and doubts and fears, come to church anyway. The problem is not with you. The problem is with the Christians that expect not to find you. Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, told a story. It was late one night and he was on a subway heading home and he was trying to get some work done. And this man got on with three or four little kids and the man sat down the kids just ran up and down the aisle. And Covey kept thinking, you know, this man's going to realize these kids are causing a problem and do something, but he didn't. And the kids were climbing over seats, they're bumping into people. And Covey looked around, and he said, you can tell everybody else is aware these kids are horrible, except Dad. And Covey said, finally, he'd had enough. So he went over to the man, and he said, sir, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but your kids are driving everyone else crazy. And the man looked at him and said, I'm sorry. We just left the hospital. Their mom just died. And I guess they don't know how to deal with it, and I don't know how to deal with it either. And Covey said, all of a sudden, all that anger he felt towards the man, do you know who he now felt it towards? Himself. See, nothing had changed in that conversation but one thing. He finally became aware of what that man was dealing with the whole time. Can I tell you something? What if you came to church and just went ahead and assumed that the person who didn't respond to you the way you wanted to was going through a really hard time? Hurting people hurt people. It's not right, it's just a reality of life. Hurting people hurt people and are often hurt by them. And you know what? So often we come and we know the pain we're feeling and we know the struggle we're dealing with. And if we're not careful, we become oblivious to anyone else's. We think we have a monopoly on hard times this week. And what happened if we walked in the door and we just went ahead and assumed that everybody I meet today is going through a hard time and that they're struggling with sorrow, with suffering, with sin, somewhere in that group they're suffering. And they came today anyway. They came today anyway. See, if you came to church today hoping for a supernatural encounter with God, you may or may not find what you hoped for. But if you came this morning expecting to hear God's word and to encounter broken, hurting people who God has called you to love and encourage and minister to, I doubt you'll be disappointed. And that's why Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews said, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And he said, but encouraging one another. Do you know one of the reasons you need to come to church? 
is you need to come and encourage somebody. Who have you encouraged today? Who is going to leave this morning and say, you know what, I'm really glad so-and-so was there? We're called to love one another. We're called to carry one another's burdens. And so we see this is what God's called us to. This is what we should expect to find. Not a community of perfect people. Not an unfiltered revelation of God's glory. But the people God loves. And you know what we often find? Someone else, like Nathaniel Hawthorne, who said one of the great compensations of this life is that no one can truly seek to help someone else without helping themselves at the same time. Do you want me to tell you how God very often reveals his glory to us? It's when we allow him to reveal his glory through us. Prior to World War II, there was a church in London that had a statue of Jesus. The arms were out, and there was a plaque that said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. During the bombings, the church was hit, and the statue was knocked over, and when it landed, the hands were broken off. And everything else in the statue was in very good shape, and they debated what to do with the statue, and someone had an idea. They changed the plaque. And the plaque now reads, we are the only hands he has to use. So you know what? If we would look at church, not as a place where we should expect to simply have an unfiltered view of God's glory, but a place where we are going to encounter people with all sorts of pain and problems in need of help. And that church, that's assembly, is to be a place where we can look to help and encourage and love one another and also allow them to do the same to us. So that's what we should expect when we come to church. But notice, second, what we should bring. What we should bring. And what we should bring is this, an openness and honesty. We see something interesting in this passage. We see two groups of people with an unfiltered honesty. The disciples come and they say, Jesus, why have we failed? Why, why couldn't we cast out this demon? Why did we fail? You know, if more people would ask God this question, our lives and our world would be very, very different. Notice, they didn't come making excuses. They came seeking direction. See, rather than excuse ourselves, if we would seek God's wisdom as to what we need to change, they don't come blaming the Father, blaming the demon, blaming the Son, blaming the crowd. They come and say, Lord, what's wrong with us? Where did we fail? I wonder what would happen in our homes, in our marriages, in our families, if more of us would come to God and ask that question. I wonder what would happen in our lives, in our churches, in our ministries, in our witness, in our relationships, in our nation. See, they decided they would rather have God's power and blessing than their excuses. Many of us would rather have our excuses than God's power. And so we don't come to God and say, God, why have we failed? God, why do I have so little of your power in my life? God, why do I have so little of your working in my life? See, if you ask God this question, he may just tell you that you're part of the problem. He may reveal things that you need to change. And most of us would rather be empty and unproductive than be forced with the truth about ourselves. They weren't. They were willing to go to Jesus and say, Lord, show us what we need to do to have your power. But they're not the only ones who got real. The father came to Jesus, said, Jesus, heal my son. And he said, if you believe, you can. And you know what that father says? I believe, help my unbelief. 
he gets really, really honest about where he is. He doesn't try to portray himself as something spiritually that he's not. He doesn't say, well, Lord, I've got, I've got, I've got great faith and I came here. He says, Lord, I believe there, there's some areas of faith, but Lord, I also see unbelief. <clears throat> the man is honest about his spiritual reality. He has a faith that is spurred by desperation and mingled by doubts. What would happen if we were as open about where we are spiritually? If we didn't try to present ourselves as more than we are? If we come to God and say, Lord, I believe, but Lord, there's unbelief there too. Lord, there's struggles mingled there too. Charlotte Elliott was an invalid living in England. <clears throat> she was in her early 30s. One day, Dr. Milan was a house guest from Geneva. He was a pastor there, and he was speaking with her. Her grandfather, one of her brothers, were pastors. She'd grown up in a Christian home. And he asked her if she had personally embraced Christ as her Savior. She was offended by his question and told him so, and he left. But she couldn't get his question out of her mind. She asked him to come back, and she talked with him more about it. And she said, you spoke to me of coming to Christ. And she said, I want to, but I've got things in my life I need to clean up first. I've got questions and doubts I need to resolve first. And, 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 I, and I believe so, but I've got this stuff I've got to figure out. And he looked at her, and he said, no, you don't. Come to Jesus just as you are. And she did. Years later, she would write an autobiographical account of her conversion. In fact, it was listening to this account that Billy Graham got saved. I want to read you part of her autobiography. Just as I am, without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. And I love verse 3. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt. Fightings and fears within, without. O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. Will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, I believe. O Lamb of God, I come. I wonder what would happen if we would be that honest with God this morning. If we would just say, you know, God, maybe you're here today and you're an unbeliever as Dan comes. <clears throat> maybe say, you know, Lord, I don't have it all figured out. My life's not all figured out. I still have questions and doubts. I still have things I haven't resolved. But Lord, I'm going to come to you today just as I am. And I'm going to allow you to fix the rest. Maybe you're a Christian today and you're dealing with some things. And, and you, you, you've got in your mind, you know, I've walked away from God in some areas. And, and i got to get this stuff straightened out. When I get it straightened out, then I'll come back. No, come as you are. The prodigal son didn't get himself cleaned up before he came home. He just got up and came home. He came to God in the midst of his brokenness. And that's what God's called us to do. To be honest enough to say, God, this is where I am right now. And God, this is what I have. And this is what I'm able to come to you with. But God, I'm going to come. We're going to have a moment of invitation. I don't know what God may be doing in your life. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today I beg you, come.
Come amidst your doubts and your questions. Come in the midst of your brokenness and your sin. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but you're struggling. Come. Dan's going to lead us in this song as our song of invitation. Andy and I are in the back. We'd love to pray with you. If we could, if you're struggling with something, if we could talk with you or pray with you, we'd love to do that. Father, we come before you today. Thank you for your blessing. (coughs) I thank you, Lord, that you're an awesome God. And in the midst of your love and compassion and mercy, you just tell us to come. You don't say get everything right, understand everything, work it out. No, you tell us to come to you and you will work it out. To turn our lives to you, our questions, our doubts, our fears, our failures to come. We pray, Lord, today that anyone is struggling today, anyone that we could be a part of blessing for your name, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand.